Good afternoon, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our worship service again today. May the Lord bless us as we worship him together. There is one announcement from your consistory, and that's with reference to the election of office bearers that is taking place. The third ballot for the election of one elder will take place, the Lord willing, on Thursday, June the 25th, from 7 to 9 p.m. at the church. Proxy votes will be accepted if you're unable to be there in person, and the brothers Bourbon and Ike, Brian Heemstra, and Herman Westerdorp Jr. remain on the ballot. Let's fire the announcement. As a pre-service song, let us sing together hymn number 167. Let us now have a moment of silent prayer and ask the Lord's blessing over our worship this afternoon. Brothers and sisters, out of respect for the Lord, let us rise if we're able for worship. This afternoon, the Lord calls us to worship with the words of Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall, be, shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Brothers and sisters, as we
come before the Lord in worship, let us confess that our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Receive now also the greeting of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. Let us praise the Lord with singing. Psalm 145, the version C. We'll now make confession of our Catholic and undoubted Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let everyone say together with me in their heart, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As a hymn of affirmation, let us sing together hymn number 572. Draw near before the Lord in prayer. 
Lord God and Father, we come before you this afternoon in worship and to sing your praises and to listen to your word. For your word is perfect, reviving the soul. Your testimony is sure, making wise the simple. Your gospel is the power unto salvation to everyone who believes. By nature, however, we are blind and incapable of doing any good. We therefore pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would illumine our minds this afternoon. Will you give us a a humble heart that is free from all pride and worldly wisdom so that when we hear your word, we may rightly understand it and that we may let our lives be guided and controlled by it. Lord, will you make us more and more certain of our Catholic and undoubted Christian faith? Graciously bring back those who are wandering or have turned from this truth, that we all in unity may serve you all the days of our lives. We ask these things only in the name of our Savior who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let us now rise and sing together Psalm 119, version G. and sisters, that I invite you to take your Bibles, and we'll read together from three sections from the New Testament from the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 
Matthew chapter 6, we'll read the first six verses. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. As far from Matthew, we'll turn to John. We'll read John chapter 15, the first eight verses. John chapter 15. I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As far from John, we'll turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, we'll read the first 14 verses. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For to me, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is of the, which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, 
that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus. Sorry, upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Thus far, our reading from God's holy word, may he add his blessing to it. We'll also read from our confessions. We read from the Belgian Confession, Article 24, and also our text this afternoon is the Word of God as we confess it and summarize it in Lord's Day 24 of the Heidelberg Catechism. So first, Belgian Confession, Article 24. You can find that it's on page 863 of the Trinity Psalter Hymnal. Article 24 of the Belgian Confession is entitled, The Sanctification of Sinners. We believe that this true faith, produced in man by the hearing of God's word and by the work of the Holy Spirit, regenerates him and makes him a new man, causing him to live the new life and freeing him from slavery, uh, for the slavery of sin. Therefore, far from making people cold toward living in a pious and holy way, this justifying faith, quite to the contrary, so works within them that apart from it, they will never do a thing out of love for God, but only out of love for themselves and fear of being condemned. So then it is impossible for this faith to be unfruitful in a human being, seeing that we do not speak of an empty faith, but of what scripture calls faith working through love, which leads a man to do of himself the works that God has commanded in his word. These works, proceeding from the good root of faith, are good and acceptable to God, since they are all sanctified by his grace. Yet they do not count toward our justification. For by faith in Christ we are justified, even before we do good works. Otherwise it could not be good, any more than the fruit of a tree could be good if the tree is not good in the first place. So then we do good works, but not for merit. For what could we merit? Rather, we are indebted to God for the good works we do, and not he to us, since it is he who works in us both to will and do according to his good pleasure. Thus, keeping in mind what is written, when you have done all that is commanded you, then you shall say, we are unworthy servants. We have done what is our duty to do. Yet we do not wish to deny that God rewards good works, but it is by his grace that he crowns his gifts. Moreover, although we do good works, we do not base our salvation on them, for we cannot do any work that is not defiled by our flesh and also worthy of punishment. And even if we could point to one, memory of a single sin is enough for God to reject that work. So, we would always be in doubt, tossed back and forth without, without any certainty, and our poor consciences would be tormented constantly if they did not rest on the merit of the suffering and death of our Savior. We'll turn now to the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 24. Lord's Day 24, here we confess. Why can't our good works be our righteousness before God? or at least a part of our righteousness. Because the righteousness which can pass God's judgment must be entirely perfect and must in every way measure up to the divine law. But even our best works in this life are all imperfect and stained with sin. How can our good works be said to merit nothing when God promises to reward them in this life and the next? 
This reward is not merited. It is a gift of grace. But doesn't this teaching make people indifferent and wicked? No. It is impossible for those grafted into Christ by true faith not to produce fruits of gratitude. Thus far, our confession. Brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, it's for the, the children, summer holidays, summer vacation, where life is, is a bit slower. Maybe you're able to take a bit of time off in the summer too and things slow down. Maybe you find that a, a bit of a relief. Life can be, life can be very busy. There's, there's lots of things to be busy with and do. Maybe you're experiencing that right now, that there's, there's 101 different things that could have your attention and that you could be busy with. And so it's a good question. It's a good question to ask yourselves, well, why? why? Why do I do the things that I do? Well, that's not a, a new question, because our fathers in the faith also ask that question as well in our confessions in the Heidelberg Catechism. The Catechism asks that question twice in, in different ways. So in Lord's Day 32, which the Lord willing you'll deal with in a couple months, it asks that question. It says, why must we do good works? And it gives a number of reasons for that, out of thankfulness to God, in order to win our neighbor, in order to assure us of our faith. But our Lord's Day this afternoon also asks the same question, but approaches it at a different angle. It asks a more basic question, what, what does God think about the good works that you do? What difference do our good works make in the way in which we are viewed by God? How does doing good works actually, actually change anything between us and God? That's an important question because you may have worked really hard this week. You may get involved with a lot of good things. You may be busy with your family or on your job, in the community. You say that was, that was a good week. But what does God think about that? What, is, what does God think about the good things that you put your effort and your energy and your time to? What, what difference do they actually make? We know what God thinks about us as believers, right? We know what God thinks about us. The previous Lord's Day of the Heidelberg Catechism summarized that very, very clearly. It asks, how are you righteous before God? And to be righteous means to be declared not guilty. It means that even though I'm a sinner, even though I'm a sinner, Christ has washed me clean from my sins. And so even though we don't deserve it, God looks at us as people who are righteous, people who have done everything that, are, that is right because of Jesus Christ. So that's, that's what God thinks of you. But then what about, what about the good things that you do, the things that you, you work so hard for? And so that's the theme for our sermon this afternoon. What does God think about the good things you do? What does God think about the good things you do? We'll see three things. We'll see that these good things are tested by God's standard. We'll see that they're rewarded by God's generous grace. And finally, we'll see that they are certain by God's life-changing power. So they're tested, they're rewarded, and they're certain. Underpinning this doctrine of the Word of God is the understanding that Christians are different, that they must be different. That when a person believes in Jesus Christ as their Savior, that this changes things, it changes them. That they're not the same person that they were before. So our catechism assumes that a Christian does do good works. It just asks, well, why? Why are you doing them? When a person is a Christian, there is a, a visible, tangible difference. There is a different lifestyle. Now, maybe that can be very dramatic. If you think of the Apostle Paul, we read in the book of Acts about the Apostle Paul and how he was traveling to the city of Damascus, and he was, he was intent on persecuting Christians. And then the Lord uh, appeared to him, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Or Saul? And, 
and his life was, was turned around dramatically. He went from being a persecutor to a preacher of the gospel. But most often in our Christian lives, the change is, is slow and incremental. Bit by bit, little by little, we recognize our sins more and more, we repent from them, and we learn to live in a different way, a new way, a distinctly Christian way. Children are born to Christian parents, and at an early age, they're, they're taught about the Lord and who He is and what He requires of them. They learn about God's promises, and by the working of the Holy Spirit, they, they learn and they respond to these promises with faith that grows in, in the heart of a child, and also their behavior and their attitude matures. So in the heart of a believer comes, comes things like an interest and a desire to, to help and serve others. Uh, an e a willingness to, to forgive someone else who has hurt us. We use our, our time differently, our money differently. There is a, a desire to, to use our, our energy to, to do good and to help others, to support God's work, the work of mission. We don't spend our, our weekends and our time like the heathen do. So God expects his people to be different. And God also empowers his people to be different by his Holy Spirit. Christians avoid the, the temptations. They avoid envy, lies. They, they don't want to hold grudges. They don't want to buy into the, the culture and music of a sinful world. When we fall into sin, we repent and we, we hate it. So we need to, to let that sink in, that God, by His Holy Spirit, works in us a change. Christians live a distinctly Christian lifestyle. But even as we grow, even as we change, even as we live in this way, this lifestyle in no way, not even the, the smallest bit, has any significance or relevance to whether God declares us righteous. The only thing that matters is faith in Jesus Christ. He's our Savior. And so our catechism asks, why? Why not? Why, why can't our, our good works be part of our, our justification? Maybe not all of it, but, but a part. Well, the answer is a clear, because our works are imperfect. And for a, a good work to have any value before God, it must be absolutely perfect, and it must be in, in complete agreement with the law of God. So God is the creator, and he created us perfect. That's how we ought to live, completely 100% according to God's law. But none of our good works are like that. None of our good works are completely in agreement with God's law. Even our best works are imperfect and tainted by sin. Even the things that we might be, might be quite proud of and, and celebrate. Times when, we, when we're worshiping the Lord and our, our hearts are filled with, with love and with gratitude to the Lord. Times when you have a, a good relationship with someone, a good connection with a, a Christian believer, and you share a, a meaningful conversation with them and, and really encourage each other. Or times when you're, you're able to help somebody, to, to selflessly give of your gifts or your time in a way that, that really helps another Christian or another fellow person in your community. Even, even those great moments in our Christian life, you would say, when judged according to God's perfect standard, are yet imperfect and still tainted with sin. Now, that's not usually how we look at things. Usually when we evaluate our behavior in our lives, we, we look at them not so much between, not so much in comparison to God's perfect standard, but in comparison to other people. And so we may compare ourselves to the way in which we see other people acting or thinking or behaving. What, what do other people think about the way in which I live my life? If most people think I'm okay, then, then I, I, 
I'm probably okay. Sometimes it can make us feel bad, but I have all these struggles and problems and nobody else seems to. Their marriages seem to be joyful and happy all the time and their, their family life seems to be perfect. They, they enjoy their work. and So sometimes this may make us feel poorly about ourselves. Other times it may make us feel proud and think, well, compared to them, I'm, I'm doing actually quite well the way in which I live my life. But the Bible shoves that aside. So that, that's not the standard by which we look at our good works. It simply isn't. The standard is in other people, but the standard is, is God's standard. What, is, what does God think of the good things that you do? That's what the Apostle Paul explains to the Philippians in the section that we read from Philippians chapter 3. You see, compared to a lot of people, the Apostle Paul was actually doing pretty good. And he, he lists for us, he lists for the Philippians a, a, a list of criteria, a list of credentials, you might say. Let's just look through them briefly. He speaks about how he was circumcised on the eighth day. So the law of Moses required circumcision on the eighth day, but as you can imagine, that's not always possible or practical. But in his case, it happened. That's a check mark there, you might say. He was of the people of Israel, even of the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin was the tribe of the first king of Israel, King Saul. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. So, in other words, he was a, a pure Hebrew. In that culture, there were some, some Jewish people who would compromise and assimilate more into the, the Greek culture, but not him. No, the apostle was, was a, a Hebrew. He describes himself as, as a Pharisee. Now, the Pharisees were the, the religious elite. They kept many laws, even additional ones that weren't in the Scripture, and they kept them strictly. They led a disciplined, strict life. Paul himself was actually taught by Gamaliel, an esteemed teacher of the Jews. He speaks about how he was even zealous, persecuting Christians, blameless. That's what he was. He was, he was blameless, so strict in keeping God's law that he was faultless. So if you, if you look at the apostles' credentials and if you compare him to other people, you would say he's doing really good. The way in which he is living his life is self-controlled discipline in the service of God. Now, if, if we were to make a list like that, as a, as a church, if you were to make a list like that, what, what could that look like? What sort of things would, would fit on your list? Perhaps for Reformed Christians, we might think of things like, uh, I'm a hard worker. Right? That's a good thing to be, to be, to be diligent in our daily calling. Or you may say, I'm a, I'm a genuine person. I, I try and be sincere with other people authentic in my relationships. Or I, or I give generously of my time and money to serve other people, as the Lord calls us to do. I'm faithful in attending church functions, in our, our Bible study opportunities, or in, in fellowship opportunities. I'm active in our community. When I, when I have a chance, I talk to my neighbors and share the gospel with them. Now, all those things are, are good and important aspects of our Christian life. They are. But none of these things can, in the least way, be our righteousness before God. The things that we might point to and invest our hopes in in that way, the Apostle says when he looks at these things previously in his life that they, that they would point to, those credentials, he says they're rubbish. They, they just have no value when it comes to salvation. The Lord is the one who sees into our hearts, who knows everything, and none of these things can make us acceptable to God. We can impress other people. Well, that's fair enough. You can do that. But to be righteous before God is much different. The Lord is the one who looks into your heart perfectly, right? So he sees your motives when you're, when you're working hard, you might see that you, this is actually motivated by greed. Or he sees perhaps that you're, you're kind to another person, but, but it's because I want something back from them. 
Or if I, if I serve, maybe it's because I love the, the adoration and respect of others. So Paul has to conclude when you, when you think about our good works like that, and when you're actually honest and think about them, you realize that they cannot be our righteousness before God. And if we, if we put that value on them, they're rubbish. They, they can't do it. We know in our heart that's true because we have this, as a believer, a, a sanctified conscience, so our conscience accuses us that we have sinned against all God's commandments. Perhaps other people didn't always see. Perhaps other people didn't always hear. But we do. So why do you, why do you work hard to do the good things that you do? Is, is it perhaps to, to make up for, for some shame and sin of the past? To try and somehow compensate for that? Well, we, well, we can't. Is it because I'm, I'm afraid of the future? I think if I, if I work hard, then I'll be okay. Is it because I, I need the acceptance of, of other people? Well, all these, all these motives, the gospel cuts right through. The gospel frees us from, from needing that because we are acceptable by God. We're cared for by Him. God makes us righteous only by His grace. God accepts us because of Christ. We're good enough not because of what we've done or not because of what other people think, but because of what God has said and done for us in Jesus Christ. The Apostle says that clearly to the Philippians. He says, I consider them, I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. So the apostle makes clear it's, it's only by God's grace. None of, these, none of these good things, they can do it. It's without any merit of our own. So what does God think of the good things that you do? Well, the first thing we've got to say, of course, is that they are imperfect. Tested by the standard of God's law, they are imperfect and defiled with sin. But that's true. And what's all this talk of rewards? That's our second point. So we've seen that our good works are, are tested by God's standard. And our second point, we'll see that they are rewarded by God's generous grace. The Bible, in many places, talks about that, about how God rewards our good works. For example, the passage we read from Matthew 6 makes that clear. It says, Your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you. Your Father will himself reward you. Now, how is that possible? Well, it's because of grace. It's only, it's only a gift. It's not something we can demand. It's not something we can deserve. Who could ever have God owe them anything? But although we are sinners, God graciously forgives us. Instead of being angry with us, he delights us. And so the amazing thing is that even though these, these good things that we do are imperfect, God promises to reward them. Because the Christian life is not easy at times. It can be a hard thing to, to live as a Christian. And so these rewards, they can encourage believers in time of persecution and hardship. For example, the Lord Jesus says in Matthew 5, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. Did you catch that? So there's this, this link between the, the hardness, the difficulty of, of Christian life, and the Lord Jesus encourages them and says, remember, remember, great is your reward in heaven. So sometimes your job might be frustrating. That's the way life works in this side of Eden, isn't it? That sometimes your work can be hard. There's poor cooperation, maybe. It's not enjoyable. It's difficult. But you remember that God rewards your faithfulness. God rewards hard work. 
sometimes sharing and, and being generous, supporting Christian work. Well, you have, to, you have to deny yourself things that you might otherwise like to buy in order to support Christian education or to support the work of mission or to, to share with the many people who are poor. That, that requires self-denial. There might be a, you know, a car or a computer or a, a renovation on your home that you love to do, but you simply can't do it. Does anybody notice? Does anybody know that? Does anybody appreciate that? Maybe they don't. The Lord encourages us that God is the one who sees, and God is the one who rewards. But we haven't earned that. But God promises a reward as an encouragement to his people. In fact, in the text we read from Matthew, the Lord warns us that, that we ought not to do our good works in order to impress other people. The fact that no one might know, well, that, that's okay. He says, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. He said, be careful about that. Be careful that your acts of righteousness, that you're not doing them for other people to see. He says, instead, your giving is to be in secret. Then your Father who does what is in secret will reward you. That's very, very counterintuitive to our culture today. A philanthropist, someone who's generous, might you know, put their name on a hospital to, to memorialize their, their generosity or might have a, a library at a university named in their honor. The Lord Jesus says, you, you've got your reward already. You've already received the only reward you're going to get. Instead, he says, give in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Well, that's an encouragement for you, because sometimes serving others, it doesn't seem to be rewarding. Sometimes uh, in a household, for example, we don't always appreciate each other as we should. Children don't always appreciate and understand what dad and mom do for them, or husbands and wives don't always recognize and appreciate what they do for one another, or in our, in our church community as well. But the Lord sees it, and he rewards our service. Sometimes as a Christian young people, a young person growing up and living faithfully, walking the straight and narrow, saying no to, to worldly temptations and entertainments. That, that doesn't seem to be rewarding. It doesn't seem to make you popular. It doesn't seem to make life easy. But we know that God sees and that he rewards. Now, we don't deserve the reward. That's the thing. We don't. It's grace. Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? We can't demand it. But God, in his grace, encourages us in our Christian life in this way. God delights to reward the imperfect work of his children. For what's more, these works are actually God's own work in our own lives. When we're justified by faith in Christ, that's God's work in us. But also, also your sanctification, also this, this change of life, is God's work in you. The apostle writes to the Philippians in chapter 2, he says, For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good pleasure. God prepares these good works in advance. And so that brings us to our third point. We'll see how these good works are certain by God's life-changing power. These good works, they're also certain. For our catechism asks, does this teaching not make people indifferent? Indifferent means careless. Who cares? Does this teaching not make people careless and wicked? This teaching that salvation is, is purity by God's grace. And that our works, they don't in any which way have relevance toward our salvation. Doesn't this teaching make you simply careless and wicked? Why don't we just do whatever we enjoy doing? Why don't we just live life however we think is going to give us the most enjoyment? Live for ourselves. Spend money on ourselves. Enjoy our, our favorite hobbies. Try and spend as, as little time working 
and as most time playing. Why not? Don't we need a a whip cracking over us to get us to go do some good work? Won't people just kick back and enjoy the sinful desires and pleasures of the flesh? Well, think back to the Apostle Paul and his conversion. You see, before the Apostle was a believer, he was a man who was zealous and ambitious within his his self-righteous religion. He was intense and disciplined, but for the wrong things and the wrong reasons. But when he when he believed in Jesus Christ and when he understood grace, that didn't mean that he was nonchalant and, and careless. Instead, he he writes in chapter three about his his drive now to serve the Lord. He says, forgetting what is behind and and straining forward to what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So he talks about about straining, about about pressing forward. Uh, that, That doesn't sound like laziness, does it? Not at all. He's like a man who's, who's running a marathon, who's, who's urgent. He presses on. And that's how it is for all of us as believers. Because, as our catechism says, it, it's impossible. It's impossible for those grafted into Christ by true faith not to produce fruits of gratitude. It's impossible. It doesn't make sense. For a, a person who's a Christian not to, to produce fruits of faith. It, it simply doesn't, doesn't work. It doesn't fit. It's like, a, like an apple tree that has never, ever, and will never bear apples. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It belongs to the nature of a Christian to bear fruit. Our Lord Jesus uses that, that metaphor in John chapter 15. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. So our Lord is here making clear that if, if a branch, if a Christian is not bearing fruit, that that Christian cannot be in Christ, just simply cannot be. If there's, no, if there's no obvious, tangible commitment to, to doing things God's way, if there's no willingness to, to repent from sins and to strive to, to get rid of them, put them behind us, that means that, that faith is dead, that there, that there cannot be a connection of the branch to the vine, to the tree. The book of James says that in a different way. It says, faith without works is dead. And that means on the day of judgment, such a person will not be saved, but will be condemned. Christians produce fruit. It's true this fruit is imperfect. But if you go to a grocery store in the wintertime, over the winter you'll see many fruits there in the grocery store that are not in season. And maybe they have blemishes or the flavor isn't as great as fruit that's in season. But it is real fruit. Imperfect fruit is still real fruit. And so our Lord Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. It's not maybe, not possibly, but you, but you will bear much fruit. When we're grafted into Christ by faith, when we have union with him, we share in his righteousness. His righteous deeds are, are credited to our account. But also we have his spirit working in us. And Christ's spirit produces this fruit in our life. So this changes why you work hard for the Lord, doesn't it? It's not out of fear then. Not out of a a terror. It's not because somehow we need to, to make up for things that we've done in the past. It's not so that we can get noticed and accepted by other people. In Jesus Christ, we can put that behind us. 
God has paid for our sins in his Son. We're righteous. And now he is at work in our hearts by his Spirit. So what's left for us? But simply to be thankful. Amen. Let us now go before our God in prayer. Our Lord God and Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace to us. For when we're honest with ourselves, when we evaluate why we do the things that we do, we have to confess that they are imperfect. That so often we have the wrong motives. So often we can be selfish, pushing our own agenda. So often we can do things out of pride and, and to show off to others. Lord, even our best works in this life are all imperfect and tainted with sin. But we thank you that in Jesus Christ you have forgiven us all of our sins. And in Christ you tell us that you have rewarded us, that you will reward us for our good works, that you crown your own work in our life. Lord, we pray that you then encourage us to pursue holiness in every area of our life that we depend upon your Holy Spirit for the strength to be fruitful, to be faithful. For without you, we can do nothing. Lord, we pray for this, your church. Lord, help us to genuinely care for one another and to be busy doing good works, using our time to spend and encourage one another, using our money to support the work of your kingdom, Lord, we pray that through our families and relationships, we would show your love to one another. We thank you that we may be part of your holy Catholic Christian church, that we may be a part of a, a church federation where churches can help one another remain faithful to your word. We thank you that we may work together as churches in this area of the world. We ask for a blessing over the work of Lighthouse Ministries, we pray, that, we pray that you'd grant wisdom to the board. Lord, that you'd provide us with opportunities to spread the gospel in our area. Lord, we think of our persecuted brothers and sisters in other countries, places where they are not able to worship you freely and openly. Lord, we ask that you'd grant relief to them, that you'd hold fast to them. We think also of those who live in countries that have been torn apart by war, Bless the members of the Canadian Armed Forces as they serve in other troubled parts of this world. Bless their missions, keep them safe. Lord, we pray that you give each one of us what we need for our daily work and calling. That as we begin this new week, we can look forward with confidence and depending upon you to do our work to the glory of your name. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, in response to God's word, let us sing together from, from hymn number 172, and we'll do so standing.
she can remain standing for a moment. This afternoon, we'll have an opportunity to give of our gifts of thankfulness to the Lord, and they'll be received this afternoon for the work of the local church and for the work of word and deed, but they're going to be received after the worship service on, on your exit. The deacons will receive your gifts of thankfulness to the Lord. I understand we'll also start uh, exiting from the back and then move to the front. So you'll have an opportunity to share of your gifts with those who are in need just directly after the worship service. So let us sing now uh, as a doxology, hymn number 570. receive now the blessing of the Lord and go our way in peace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.